Hello, and welcome to this video. This lecture covers four sociological perspectives on death, structural functionalism, symbolic interactionism, social learning theory, and conflict theory. But first, I'll give an introduction, an overview, of learning about death from a culturally sensitive perspective. Now that you can see my PowerPoint. We want to approach death and dying with an open mind, but that's not always easy to do, given that we carry cultural biases favoring our own ways of doing things. We are all, to some extent, ethnocentric. We view our own norms, values, beliefs, and cultural practices surrounding death and grief as normal, as the obvious, or perhaps even the only correct, way. While we may be good at understanding death in our own culture, because we are insiders after all, we are not as good at understanding death in other cultures where we are outsiders, or at seeing our own culture from different perspectives. Here's a famous example. Pause the video and read about the people called the Nasarima. Now that you've read these two paragraphs, what kind of people are these? How would you describe them? Where do you think they live? Why? Most students at this point say things like, wow, they're really superstitious. They believe their teeth will fall out of their head if they don't do this ritual. They believe in the power of strange magical potions. It sounds like rituals I've seen on National Geographic. These people definitely live in the jungle or in a tribe somewhere, probably in the developing world. They're kind of backwards. And so, but reread the passage and look for any similarities to your culture, perhaps the beliefs and practices that you hold. Think generally. Upon rereading, usually a few students go, oh, and have an aha moment, and when pressed, they explain that the ritual being described is simply brushing one's teeth. Seen from an outsider's perspective, this could be what our teeth brushing rituals look like, and it's hard for us to see something that we take for granted in any different way. Note that this may be what it sounds like to people in other cultures when we describe them to themselves. They might think, what? This American doesn't understand us at all. This is the gist of ethnocentrism, a lack of cultural understanding. Specifically, an ethnocentric view frames our culture as normal and superior to other cultures, while other cultures are backwards, dangerous, or inferior to ours. Instead of judging another culture from your perspective, try to see it objectively. Here's a good comic that paints ethnocentrism in a funny light. Right? Everybody has a government, every society has a government, a religion, a population. But these alien comics are, are funny for doing this, for representing, or for pointing out ethnocentrism. Um, why do we represent love with a heart through an arrow, with an arrow through it? If an arrow goes through a heart, the person dies. That's not love, it's murder. Cupid would get 25 to life, but we don't. We have a long history of shared cultural understanding equating an arrow-pierced heart with romance. And so this objectively deadly thing makes perfect sense to us as a symbol of love, but somebody from another culture might not understand this and think it was quite morbid. So instead of an ethnocentric view, we are studying death, grief, and dying from a cultural relativist perspective. We are seeking to understand other cultures on their own terms, rather than evaluating them from the standards of our own culture. All norms, values, beliefs, and practices in other cultures exist for a reason that makes sense within that culture, just like yours do within your culture. Even if it seems weird, gross, or wrong to you, your job is to set your judgments aside and instead seek to understand. We can practice understanding and cultural relativism by learning about different theoretical perspectives on death. Theories are sets of interrelated ideas with a wide range of applications that have been vigor rigorously tested and are pretty good at explaining reality. They help us explain social phenomena in different ways. So if you're a photographer, you know that fitting the camera with a different lens makes you see the same thing a bit differently. The fish eye gives a wide mac macro level view and the zoom gives you a narrow but in-depth micro view. So in this lecture, I want to look at death through two huge lenses, sociological through one lens, uh, sociological one. In these broad perspectives, these broad sociological perspectives, we'll see how death shapes society 
and how society shapes death, including responses to death at various levels from the micro-individual to the macro-institutional. Peter Berger, a social theorist who studied religion and the sociology of knowledge, said that every human society is, in the last resort, people banded together in the face of death. Death is central to society and culture. You could even argue that a major function of society and culture is to protect us from death and all that comes with it, prolonging physical death, ameliorating death anxiety and the ever-looming threat of non-existence, and helping us to cope with the loss of loved ones. We're going to look at four broad sociological perspectives to help us explore this sociocultural view. The first is structural functionalism. This structural view of society is most easily thought of metaphorically. Societies are like bodies. They are immeasurably complex structures consisting of smaller parts. Each part serves specific functions to make the whole thing work. The functions of the smaller parts are interrelated, and if all is going smoothly, then the whole is ordered and stable. Imagine that your head is the government, your heart is the family structure, your hands are the institution of work, your brain is education, your liver is the death system, and so on. What happens if you go blind? Your sense of hearing becomes sharper. If you lose an arm, you learn to rely on the other one. If any part of the system changes, the rest of the system adapts. For example, death has become medicalized. Since World War I or so, death and dying have moved away from the family and religious institutions more under the purview now of medical professionals. So changes in the medical institution, the advancement of medical technology and the further professionalization of medicine have effected a change in how death happens. The classical sociologist Emile Durkheim, who is associated with structural functionalism, noted that death brings about social solidarity in society. Research on the functions of funerary rites shows this clearly within families, communities, and even on a national scale when a beloved figure, like an ex-president or a pop star, dies. 9-11 is a classic example of this, when we would never forget the American lives tragically lost, and American flags were flown outside houses across the country. Think about the collective response to COVID-19, as the pandemic became more serious over time. The vast majority of Americans do take the virus seriously, wear masks, and messaging from most authority sources is one of unity, often framed as a war metaphor to defeat a common enemy. It's death. The enemy is always death in the end. Death is sort of the ultimate disruption to the social order, while at the same time being part of the social order. And social groups always have to adapt to the changes brought about by death. Emile Durkheim is also famous for his seminal study, Suicide, published in 1897. In it, he showed that the most individual of acts, killing oneself, actually has social causes. According to Durkheim, suicide rates are higher in places where people experience the most anomie, or normlessness, where people have less meaning or direction in their lives, and where people are the least connected by social bonds to individuals and groups. A function of religion, therefore, is to increase social solidarity. Religion gives people's lives meaning. Places where religious affiliation are highest tend to have lower suicide rates. So a functional perspective looks at the function of death in society and how changes in social structure affect changes in how societies deal with death. Symbolic interactionism is the second sociological perspective here. It is a micro view of society showing how the meanings that people share pattern larger social structures. Meanings are like Lego blocks. So if we are all re repulsed by corpses, we learn to be repulsed by death as children, TV and movies make corpses scary, our parents reprimand us for touching dead animals, then the society, the larger society, will likely deal with human remains in such a way as to reflect this widely shared view that death is scary and corpses are repulsive. So if someone dies, they're covered with a sheet, they get put in the back of the ambulance, they go to the morgue underground, they're made to look as lifelike as possible before being buried far away in a cemetery that might be haunted, and in reality, in reality, most people rarely visit the dead. We can change the meanings that we hold for things, though. For example, symbols, like emojis, the death icons on the slide here, have many different meanings in many different contexts. There's a noose. What does that mean? Suicide? A racist symbol? An exasperated quote at the end of my rope? or a silly emoji to send to a friend. Alan Kelleher's social history of dying is relevant from an interactionist framework because the point is that meaning, the meaning of death and dying changes over time and across cultures. There is no inherent meaning associated with death. Some death is considered good, while other death is bad. 
from a symbolic interactionist perspective, all meaning is socially constructed. So for a larger example of this, a larger example of a symbolic interactionist analysis, take a look at the video of traditional Chinese religious rituals in this week's content folder on D2L. As you watch it, think about the meanings that these people share for each of the symbols or objects in the video, and try to answer the question, what's going on here? Pause and watch the video now. So, what did you observe? You saw pallets of fake paper money with decorative pillows on top being set on fire. You saw people kneeling on a stool, their shoes off, making ritualized gestures with incense. You saw a man walking around cracking a whip and heard droning music. As an outsider to this religious practice, you might be confused or at least not have a very good idea of what's going on. But you're probably aware of some of what is going on here if you think about it, if you compare it to your own religious practices, if you think back on books or movies. Why might these people be kneeling? Kneeling is often a show of respect, as it is here. So who or what are they respecting? Well, you recognize this as a religious ceremony, so perhaps a god or gods, spirit, spirits or ancestors. Why are they burning things? Well, you probably also are aware of burning things as offerings. Again, offerings to whom? Well, we know they're burning fake money. Why would you burn money? Here's the answer. They're burning money to send to the ancestors in the afterlife, so they may have wealth. They're burning pillows to send to the ancestors in the afterlife, so they may have comfort. It's important to care for and respect the ancestors so that they will watch over you. And interestingly, the things that the ancestors care about money and comfort are the same things that these people care about. So from a symbolic interactionist perspective, the meanings that people attach to each of these small things is highly significant. Again, meanings are like Lego blocks. Taken together, the fact that people share the meaning of the fake money, the gong sounds, and so on, allows them to act together and make this ritual happen. The meanings these people have in their everyday lives affect how they act toward their ancestors, and how they perceive their ancestors to act toward them. Thus, from a symbolic interactionist perspective, the meanings that people hold toward things is the basis of social structure. We learn the meanings of things, including norms associated with death and grief, through social learning. Social learning theory explains that our behavior is rewarded by conforming to social norms and punished for failing to conform. We also see how other people are rewarded or punished, which is called vicarious learning. And we learn to adjust our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors accordingly. We often take for granted the subtle ways that conformity is re rewarded. For example, a child attends her first funeral and notices that the mood is somber. They refrain from playing and adopt the somber tone. No one may explicitly praise the child for taking on the correct attitude at the Western funeral. Susie, you are so sad, great job. But all sorts of subtle, nonverbal cues may serve to reinforce the child's conformity to the social norm. A quiet hand on the shoulder during the eulogy, a quick smile from an aunt. The first funeral experience is often part of the child's primary socialization surrounding death. Finally, the fourth sociological perspective we're looking at is conflict theory. Conflict theory offers a useful critical perspective on death. Sociologists trace this perspective back to Karl Marx, who wrote extensively about the antagonisms between the upper class and the lower class, or between the people who held power and means to create wealth in society and those who do not. Interestingly, the wealthy and powerful have far better health outcomes than the rest of us, especially the lower class. The wealthy have better access to medical care, more leisure time, and they are less stressed. They can afford more healthy foods, they exercise more frequently, they take work off for health problems, and they are less, and they have better insurance. Thus, they tend to live longer and healthier lives. Data show the gap in life expectancy between the richest and the poorest Americans to be about 10 years for women and 15 years for men. So Marx's work on social class is very relevant to the study of death. Marx is famously quoted as saying that religion is the opium of the people. This is always taken a bit out of context, but he's making a conflict theorist point that society is held together by coercion and power, not, as a structural functionalist might say, by social solidarity and all the pieces harmoniously fitting together. Religion, according to Marx, is deployed by elites to keep the rest of us docile. If we are focused on being good, that is, conforming, 
for the reward of a better life after we die, then we are less likely to make trouble, to disrupt the status quo, and fight for a better life on Earth. If we are taught that suffering is divine, then we are willing to accept social inequalities. Conflict theory analyzes social phenomena from the perspective that power, money, and other resources are unequally distributed. Those who hold power have a stake in maintaining the status quo and maintaining their position on top. So back in the era of slavery in the United States and in pretty much any colonizing project around the globe, slave masters wanted their slaves to adopt Christianity, but the only interpretation, but only the interpretation as spoken by the slave masters. They didn't want their slaves to learn to read so that they could interpret the Bible for themselves. Thus, the promise of heaven and eternal salvation as defined by white masters was strong motivation, along with physical punishment, for good behavior. Think of modern ways that churches, especially rich megachurches and televangelists, have exploited the fear of death and hell to secure religious conformity and ties. Or check out critical discussions of the sales and marketing tactics of funeral homes. Do you really need that diamond-encrusted coffin? It's the best way to honor Uncle Joe. You do want to honor Uncle Joe, don't you? Well, we're vulnerable during times of grief, grief and, and death, and the death industry can take advantage of that. See Jessica Mitford's classic book, The American Way of Death, for a scathing criticism of the death industry in the United States. Other people tout miracle cures for cancer, just drink urine, coronavirus, drink bleach, and just about anything else. There's a new show on Netflix right now that I haven't watched called Unwell that explores the exploitative side of the wellness industry. So, conflict theory explains social phenomena in terms of unequal access to power, money, and resources. Psychological theories about death are also important to understand, but we will get to these more when we discuss grief and coping. We actually have already covered three of them. The psychoanalytic tradition of Erickson, where in each phase of psychosocial development throughout life, we resolve various internal conflicts and hopefully have a positive outcome leading to self-growth and ultimately an understanding and acceptance of our own mortality. Terror management theory, which similarly comes from the psychoanalytic tradition, wherein we are all anxious and in denial about death and do everything we can to cope with or avoid it. And the cognitive psychological tradition of Piaget, who focused on stages of cognitive development throughout infancy, childhood, and adolescence. In each of Piaget's stages of development, children gain greater understanding of death, eventually leading to a mature concept of death as universal, irreversible, having specific causes, and happening when the body quits functioning. Other important psychological perspectives include humanism, existentialism, and the positive psychology movement. These and other theoretical perspectives, as well as current social trends and challenges, are important to consider when seeking to understand death. Hopefully this video has given you a solid foundation for being able to understand death-related phenomena through four different sociological perspectives. Thank you for watching.